Good morning, everybody. My name is Jake Kohler. I'm a member of the Wharton MBA admissions committee. And while you're not going to be looking at me through the entire duration of this program, I do want to welcome you. I want to say thank you for being part of this. And I want at least you to see that I dress up for this occasion, even uh, from the comfort of my home, uh, one mile south of campus, uh, but also just have a face saying, uh, I hope you're while you're watching this, you are well, you're healthy, and hopefully uh, at the end of it as well, you'll feel more confident and comfortable as you prepare to uh, complete your application for the Wharton MBA program this fall or this year. Uh, so with that said, I'm going to take my screen off and the remainder of the time, we're gonna talk about Wharton and the application process that uh, will follow. Before we jump into all the application details itself, uh, I do wanna make sure I talk about some parts of the Wharton program, I and mean, even at a really high level. Uh, the Wharton MBA is foundationally built upon these three principles. We incubate ideas, we create leaders, and we drive insights. And across every single major and concentration that we offer, no matter where you're coming from or what industry you're planning to move towards in the future, or what type of product you're hoping to create or innovate in the future, these underlying principles will impact the way you experience the Wharton MBA program. Our community, obviously has been founded. We're the uh, oldest business school. We, our first MBA class came in 1921. But since that time, we've grown remarkably. We have nearly 100,000 living alumni of Wharton. In any given year, there's over 1,700 MBA students split between our two MBA classes. And the statistics you see at the bottom are representative of last year's enrolled class. Uh, about 46% female students, 36% U.S. students of color, and we had representation from over 60 different countries. And the diversity of minds and thoughts that come into our class are incredibly meaningful and something that we seek because we believe that every single student will be able to learn and grow from the contributions and thoughts and experiences of those around them. And we find lots of ways to engage each person and each group to make sure they do get that benefits of learning from all of the members of their class. Uh, but ultimately, when we look at our program, it starts with you. And that little uh, emoji type person at the center of the screen is actually representative of the fact that we believe that an MBA program should be personalized to the individual who's pursuing it. Uh, the way that we structure all parts of our program are to emphasize the fact that you and your intimate motivations and goals and the skills and knowledge that you individually believe you need to gain in order to grow and, and reach your future goals should be foundational to the program that you have and the advisors that you have and the work that you do will be commensurate of that notion that you will get to personalize your program even within the broader structure. But you are obviously going to learn from lots of people around you and we create small and large mechanisms for that. The most elemental part is our learning team structure. We use uh, a lot of guidance in order to create the most possible diverse learning teams of six individuals who you will work with in your first year core classes, taking all those courses together, working on group projects with these same six individuals. And that team is going to be representative of different uh, industry backgrounds, different job functions, different uh, citizenships and geographic backgrounds, different identities, different genders, because we believe again, that learning from a diverse group and working collaboratively in a diverse group of minds is actually gonna promote the development of all members of that learning team. Within uh, your learning team is actually gonna be one of uh, 12 different learning teams that comprise a cohort in the Wharton community, which is a broader academic unit that we have within the class. But we have uh, four different clusters within our group, each comprised of three different cohorts. And that cluster is the social home and another unit of your program that you'll get to grow and learn and network and uh, be with during that time. We have a some really exciting and interesting uh, programs and games that we 
use with our clusters uh, that kind of start with our cluster Olympics that happen throughout the first year, particularly during our preterm area. Obviously, the entire Wharton MBA class, 864 students, will ultimately become part of that family that you grow with over the course of that two-year period. Our curriculum is designed to make sure that there are certain foundational items that everybody will have. That's what our core is made up of. And you'll see we use units, uh, we call them credit units, but in effect, just consider it as each course is about one credit unit in our program. And while you'll take somewhere between 19 and 21 credit units, CUs, over the course of the two-year program, about half of them will be built in a core, laying the foundation and giving you some structure um, that could apply to whatever industry, whatever jobs you have in the future. But the other half is actually gonna allow you to explore and grow and build upon those specific skills and knowledge areas that you see most fitting to you. We have a variety of programs that are also integrated into the broader MBA, which include the Lauder, uh, MBA MA in International Studies, an incredible opportunity to get uh, increased exposure, language, and cultural immersions into different uh, parts of the world in addition to the MBA that happens just in that same two-year period. We have the Carry JD MBA program, which is a three-year combined program between uh, the Carry Penn Law School as well as the Wharton MBA program. We have the healthcare management program, which is a major and program associated with the broader MBA, as well as over 15 other joint degree programs. But even if you're part of one of these programs, I want you to know, again, they are integrated. They're part of the fabric of the broader MBA and you get all the experiences and benefits of the full MBA in addition to some of the other uh, wonderful opportunities associated with those programs. No matter what, uh, program or parts of the pro uh, parts of the MBA that you explore. Uh, one of the things that's unique and, and distinctive about the way that we structure our program and the way that we provide guidance and support to you is our advising support network. Or on campus, we'll just call it the ASN. And what that includes is four different advisors: one in academics, one in career management, one in leadership, and one in student life that will all work as a team to support you in making sure that each of these four different pillars of your MBA experience are being built and grown uh, collaboratively and thoughtfully to make sure, that, again, that your interests and the things that you want to grow the most in and gain are supported across all of these different areas. Um, again, this is a team at, and a unit that is going to support you and your entire cluster during your two-year program. Benefits that extend from the Wharton MBA are not just in that two-year period. So while we talk a lot about the benefits, the features that you experience right away, I'd be remiss if I didn't recognize that once you graduate from Wharton, you are still part of the family, this lifelong community that's connected through different global forums and reunions and webinars that you have access to that you're able to explore. Every seven years after graduation, you're actually welcome to come back to campus to take part in one of our executive education courses for free, um, which is typically uh, a, a more expensive venture for people outside of the Wharton community. You also have the ability to get career support over the course of your time, even after you have graduated. And these are all resources that we dedicate to you because we believe it's important for the Wharton MBA to last the rest of your life. And also for our what we find is our alumni, because of those resources, because of those benefits they continue to gain, they are back and they're supporting all the other members, our current students and the young alumni as they go through. And that sort of network becomes uh, ingrained into all the members of our Wharton community. With all that said, I know the primary reason that we're talking today is to discuss your application. And as we go through, uh, I know the term holistic admissions is used uh, basically all the time. Um, it's more an omnipresent term that uh, almost doesn't seem as helpful as it's intended to. So I'm gonna explain what holistic admissions means to our team. And at the foundation of it, our philosophy when we read applications, myself as an admissions committee member and every single other person who works for the Wharton MBA team, 
believes in the philosophy that we read every single application with the intent to admit that student. We are going to seek to find what are the reasons why this individual can contribute, can gain, can learn, and can succeed. So all the parts of your application as we go through them, I want you to think about how can you cultivate and help us see where you'll have success because that's what we're most intimately looking for in the process. We also believe in having blind, independent reads of every application. Uh, and what that means to us is there will be at least two members of our team that will read your application, but in independent reads, it means that neither of them will actually get an opportunity to see or discuss how they are reviewing your application until after their review and their uh, professional judgment and expertise has been considered independently on your application. And after those independent reads, then we come together to discuss the merits of the application. This avoids any opportunity for bias to come into play. And as I'm suggesting, what our objective is to do is reduce bias or any noise that can come in that could negatively impact the review of any application. And this ultimately ensures that we have created a fair and equal shot for any single individual to be admitted into our program. There's uh, in total about six different pieces of information or buckets of information that you will provide to us throughout your application. It includes some background biographical information, obviously your community engagement, your academic history, testing information, certainly the professional experiences you've had, which includes your resume as well as other jobs that you've um, participated in and conducted, responsibilities, awards, or honors you've had. You obviously will have different essays that you discuss, and there's uh, two individuals who write letters on your behalf. But with all of this information, I want you to think of how can any piece of information shared here help inform our committee of why you will succeed in the Wharton MBA classroom, why you will be able to contribute or how you can contribute into the Wharton community, and why you will be able to have success in your career. And if you think across all of these different buckets of information, if they're all informing us about, again, your ability to achieve in a classroom, in our community, and in your career, you're putting yourself in a really good position. I'm gonna show, moving forward, a number of different parts of the application. And these are snapshots of our application page in itself. Uh, after you share some of your biographical information, you have the opportunity to select the program that you to apply to. If you're planning to apply to just a full-time MBA program, you would click just MBA in that case. If you're interested in the Cary JD MBA program, you have two different options in terms of the uh, which of those programs you would click, but you would select that program right up front. The same thing if you are applying uh, as part of the Lauder Institute, you would, you would select that specific program at this point in your application. The vast majority of our applicants apply straight through the MBA, so that is likely the number that, uh, sorry, that's likely the button you would select at that stage. As you work through some of the personal information sections, you will see that, uh, that there is an extracurricular activities space. And that extracurricular activity space allows you to share any sort of information. We give you five different activities which we know you could be involved in more or less than that, but we give five that, and I encourage maybe five that are most important to you or that you've invested the most amount of time in, uh, in your recent career or you really want to call attention to as part of your application. We also know, so I'll start with, these can include a work-based activity. So let's say you're part of some sort of uh, community or work environment club organization network you're able to share that sort of work activity into this extracurricular space. We encourage you to share the year's involvement about how much time you spend in that as well, and any sort of positions held uh, over the course of your time there. Obviously, are there volunteer organizations or external to work or school involvements you've had can also serve a place in that extracurricular sector. Some of you will have many of these and be in, in excess of five different activities. There will be a number of you who will have fewer. 
some of you have your own families and other obligations and even though they're not uh, they might not feel like extracurricular activities we want you to know that not necessarily having five or ten different activities and involvements when you're working incredible hours and doing incredible things professionally and sometimes per and personally as well it's okay not to necessarily fill this up uh, it's not a requirement to have five activities but we want to give space for those of you who are involved and this is just one of those opportunities to share what engagements you have or have had in the past that share how you engage with the people and communities around you as far as the academics and testing, uh, we know that the current year has led to a bunch of changes in standardized testing formats. We want to make sure every single applicant is aware that we will accept the at-home test option if that is the test that you decided to take. And we know that the analytical writing section is not always part of that. That is fine for us. So whatever test you have taken in terms of the GMAT or the GRE, we are still at this point going to require one of those two tests but we'll accept either the in-person if you had that in the past or as long as you're staying safe being able to complete the at-home version is also acceptable we accept tests um, that have been taken within the past five years um, which is the duration of the time that both gmat and ets who uh, oversees the gre um, allow for those tests to be uh, complete Another part of your application that obviously gets a lot of attention is your resume. Um, and there's a bunch of different pieces of information that can kind of pull from a resume. And we're going to try to share the insights that are most helpful to us. So let's use our friend Pamela Beasley as an example. And we'll work through her resume to see what that, uh, what it could have looked like and what information we can learn. First and foremost, what I think is really important for anybody applying to know is we do have a preference that your resume will fit on one page. If you look at the structure of this page though, it's not exactly eight and a half by 11. And I want you to know from us that you can update the format uh, and the layout of your resume, not excessively, but if it's a, you know, a resume page style format, that's actually okay for us. And you can, again, work with the margins a little bit to add that extra layer if that additional real estate on the paper is meaningful to you. You're not required to write a full script of your professional history, but a one page document that's eight and a half by 11, or maybe even just slightly longer than eight and a half by 11, if it's necessary to fill, um, to share important information is acceptable to us. There's ultimately about four broader buckets of information uh, that we want to see within your application. But within that, uh, the different companies you work for might not always be clear to us. So maybe you're not totally familiar with what the Dunder Mifflin Group is. So being able to use in italics and small parentheses a brief description of whatever workplace you're part of, if you're working for a boutique firm or a smaller firm that we uh, that a reader might not have full awareness of, I encourage you to be able to share a little bit of insights about the company, maybe uh, the amount of uh, the, the acquisitions or types of acquisitions or type of uh, work that that organization does can be really powerful to us so we know who the Dunder Mifflin Group is or what the Michael Scott company uh, actually performs in their time. Again, there's about four different pieces of information that we learn from your resume. One is your career readiness. And this come, and we learn about your career readiness through two different things. One could be the types of roles and the increased responsibilities that you've had over the course of your time. And seeing that sort of job growth can be a powerful indication of your career readiness. But the experiences and the bullet points that you place in your resume as well can also indicate your ability to achieve in your career, your opportunities to work and grow with C-suite executives can be indicative of career readiness. And these are great things to highlight in your resume. We also try to learn about how you engage with other people uh, in your resume. Again, a big part of our community the, and the MBA program is your ability to work and partner and collaborate with those around you, that learning team, the cohort, your cluster, et cetera. 
So finding ways in your resume to be able to highlight where you've engaged with others, whether they're um, senior executives or uh, senior member clients or just other colleagues, being able to highlight and share insights about how you've worked with and made impact in the uh, community spaces around you and partnering with other individuals. It's not just a singular uh, or individualized activity um, that you're participating. We also look for general management potential. And this can come again from showing the different types of responsibilities you've had, different types of managerial experiences, or even if you haven't been a direct supervisor to somebody, when you've been able to lead teams in different projects or in different uh, work opportunities, these are all great things to be able to highlight, whether they're at a senior level or again, just in the regular day-to-day -day operation or short-term project showing that general management potential can be a really positive item to highlight in your resume. The final thing that I'd like to call out is other opportunities for leadership and impact. And again, this can be formal or informal, but sharing that sort of impact and leadership that you've had and the experiences and the skills that you may be already developing in that space can translate into the Wharton community. And as our team is looking at how we place you and how we see your abilities to succeed in our classroom environment, we want you to be able to grow um, and share how you can help others grow in that team. So that's where sharing leadership and impact can be powerful to us. As I shared earlier, essays are clearly something that we are going to seek um, in your application. The first essay question that we ask is what do you hope to gain professionally from the Wharton MBA? This is the same question that we've asked for several years now and there's three components that we think a good essay um, response has. The first is what we call a setup. It's a brief description of some of the work experiences or personal experiences you've had that have uh, demonstrated what you have learned thus far and maybe even sharing what some of your future goals may be. It's again, setting up the foundation of why an MBA might be powerful to you. The pivot point in our, uh, is what we term as the skills or knowledge gaps that you have that you want an MBA to fulfill. It's basically the description of why is an MBA important to you at this time? And your ability to identify, again, the setup, some of the goals that you have in the future, the skills and knowledge that you want to have can ultimately be satisfied and fulfilled through the final part of your response, which is the future. It's how can your short and long-term goals and the skill and knowledge gaps that you're seeking to develop in your MBA be fulfilled by the Wharton MBA program. And it's really important in this essay and really every essay that you share with us, making really strong connections, really drawing the lines for us of what specific programs, whether it's classroom or co-curricular programs, will give you the skills and help you satisfy and achieve your future ambitions. And if you do all of those three things within that essay, you have done a really good job in that response. Our second essay question has actually been updated for this year, similar in nature, but we're now asking for you to take into consideration your background, including your personal, professional, and or academic background, how you plan to make specific, meaningful contributions to the Wharton community. And this, que this question is intended for you to, again, share insights about your background, things that matter to you as a person, whether it's identity-based, or experiences that you've had, or things that you see in the future that you really want to contribute, um, and how your role can be played into the broader Wharton MBA community. We believe we are filled with a community of givers and takers, people who can both contribute a lot and be able to gain and grow from the experiences of others. So if there's certain um, involvements you've had, experiences you've had that you think make you stand out, and things that you see yourself being able to make uh, a legacy for yourself or a real impact within the Wharton community, I encourage you to be able to connect those parts of your story to our program, whether it's a program that we already have and offer that excites you or knowledge of wanting to create 
your own sort of impact that might not be something we already have but you believe can fit and you see areas where it could fit and grow within the Wharton community. We've also updated the way we framed our additional information and optional essays section. So the question here is ultimately providing you the space after the two essays that we ask for you to share any other information that might be relevant or pertinent for the admissions committee to know or consider. This can include any sort of potential weakness or gaps or um, areas of pause that you have in your application. It could also just be additional information that you, after filling out all the other questions in the application, you either felt from an identity standpoint or from an interest standpoint or a goal standpoint that you weren't able to share as fully elsewhere. So any additional information that you want the our committee to uh, be aware of and understand this is not an evaluative essay of any sort, but it is a space for any additional information to be shared with us so that we can consider it fully. Again, the first thing I shared to you about our philosophy is that we read every application with the intent to admit the student applying. So if there's any information that can help us understand you better, you should place it in this optional essay section or this additional information section. We have one other essay that is only required and seen by individuals who may be reapplying to the Wharton MBA. So if you applied to Wharton in any other iteration or any previous year, um, whether to the MBA, full-time MBA, et cetera, we want you to be able to share some insights and reflect upon the growth you've had and be able to discuss relevant updates to your candidacy. For some of you, you may have applied last year in round three, uh, and didn't get admitted. And even in the couple months that have hap that have existed since your last application, there's certain updates that you've had, whether it's professional or personal opportunities. These don't need to be novel or monumental changes, but we do like to be able to see how you have developed or what else has happened since the last time you applied. We only look at your current application in the initial stage of your application review. So being able to share these types of updates, these development opportunities can be really powerful to us in that initial stage of the evaluation process. The final thing that I'll talk about before I kind of uh, went as it, as it relates to the application is the recommendation section. We do require that you have two recommenders right on your behalf. This first screen shows the information that you will see on your application. And as soon as you start working through your application and you get to this page, I encourage you again, all you need to do is write the first name, the last name, the email address. It can be professional or a personal email address of the recommender. We don't have a preference for one or the other. So whatever is the best email address for that individual and you have the ability to uh, waive your right to actually review the letter of recommendation yourself. Once you know the individuals, that are going to write on your behalf and you've spoken with them. I ask that I ask that you click the submit recommendation request right away. You do not need to wait until the end of your application or until you're done with your application to click that button, but you should click uh, submit recommendation request as soon as you know the individuals, you've spoken with them, and you have the appropriate email address for them. When, after you click that submit request, they will get an automatic uh, email that provides them access to the recommendation form. And while you don't see the questions that uh, we ask the recommenders, I wanna share with you what those questions are to help you try to identify who might be an appropriate individual. So the questions we ask are, please provide examples that illustrate why you believe this candidate will be will find success in the Wharton MBA classroom. The second question is, please provide example or examples that illustrate why you believe this candidate will find success throughout their career. And our classroom is designed, again, to be in a collaborative environment where an, different analytical tools, um, quantitative and qualitative, are utilized in ways that people can share insights, grow with one another, 
in whether it's a simulation type course, a case-based course, or a lecture. So we're not necessarily asking for an academic to share insights about why you would find success in the classroom. We believe that any employer, any client, any colleague can actually share insights about how you're able to use, again, analytical um, methodologies, how you're able to work collaboratively with different people. We are a collaborative work-based and classroom environment. And we want to see how those individuals anticipate and what examples they can provide for why you would be able to succeed in that sort of learning environment. The second question is a little bit more straightforward. Again, anybody can respond to this, but we, again, we're looking for the future of your career, not just what you've done in the past, but what sorts of examples give that recommender uh, uh, confidence that you're going to be able to grow and develop throughout your career and find success even after your MBA. And who the two people that you asked to write your recommendations will answer both of these questions. And they're really powerful insights for us as a committee to learn. Those were all of the different parts of our application. But ultimately, there's the whole process that happens afterwards. So we do have three application rounds for the regular MBA application pool. Our round one and round two, uh, are there's no difference, no preference on our side as to which time or which round you apply. You can apply in round one, which is a September 15th deadline. Uh, you would find out your admissions decisions in December. Our round two deadline is January 5th of 2021, with admissions decisions being released sometime in late March. And our round three, which is the smallest application round for regular uh, applicants, is March 31st of this upcoming year. You will see that there is a MOLIS round as well, which is the same time as round three. The MOLIS Advanced Access Program is a deferred enrollment program. So if there's any current undergraduate student, a student in their final year of study can apply to our deferred enrollment program, again called the MOLIS Advanced Access Program. That application deadline is also March 31st. Once your application is submitted, you, our admissions committee will do full independent reads of your application. And after those in, independent reads, we come together, discuss, and ultimately we'll send an invitation to interview to a select number of our applicants. It is only those applicants who have had uh, the, the interview invitation and take part in the interview process that are later considered for admission. And once your interview is scheduled and completed, we then meet again as an admissions committee, review all the contents of your file, including all the parts of your application that you submitted earlier, as well as the new information that we gain through the interview to before we make our final admissions decisions. I do wanna share some insight about our interview process because it is different than most other MBA programs. We take part in what we call a team-based discussion. It is a leaderless group exercise with somewhere between five and six individuals typically that are all shared a prompt about a week in advance of the session. And you ultimately, your team-based discussion includes 35 minutes inclusive of a one minute pitch that you have a full discussion with the team, and ultimately a brief, you know, three to five minute presentation of your team's final recommendation. To prepare for the team-based discussion, my suggestion is that you do enough research just to be able to support and provide insights to the one minute pitch that you provide that kicks off the initial conversation. The previous experiences you've had, the times where you've seen really strong collaborative teams, Think about the different skills and tactics that you've used to be able to build an entire group together with you. But ultimately, we're not looking for you to be or satisfy any particular roles. What we wanna be able to see and recognize in this team-based discussion portion is how you're able to have conversations with people that think the same way or think differently than you and how you can all work collaboratively together. Our team-based discussion and our interview process is not a binary process. 
So it's not as though you just get to the interview and if you um, do great in the interview, you're admitted and if you don't have a great day in the interview, you get denied. It's again, just one additional piece of information in terms of everything else that we've learned. And because our team-based discussion groups are created randomly, there is the chance that all six members of your team-based discussion can be admitted into the program. And there's a chance that very few of the people can be admitted. So my recommendation is not to view it as an opportunity to compete against the other people. That is by no means a successful strategy. But if you all support one another in helping pull out the different ideas and thoughts from that team-based discussion, you will all actually have um, a stronger team-based discussion and all be typically do better in the process as a result. After the 35-minute team-based discussion, we do hold 10-minute one-on-one conversations with every single individual that participated in the team-based discussion. And in that, I encourage you to share uh, information that might be part of your application or otherwise. The interviewer will have one or a couple questions to share with you, but there's a high likelihood that our interviewer did not actually read your application in the initial stage. We actually work really hard to try to avoid somebody who was one of the two independent reviewers of your application to later be your interviewer. So I encourage you when you think about the one-on-one -on -one, and if you get to that stage of the interview process, I want you to think uh, to make sure you're comfortable sharing information that may be found elsewhere in your application because that information might be uh, new or it likely would be brand new to the person interviewing you. So being able to share thoughtfully any information, again, that speaks to your interests in Wharton or your ability to achieve in your career are probably going to be helpful insights that you can share with that individual. Before I get to your questions, there's just a couple other tips that I want to make sure I leave with you before we wrap up. Some of those uh, are that you are able to self-report your transcript grades as well as self-report the uh, GRE or GMAT scores that you have in your application. So if you don't have the ability to get official documents at this time, we know in different countries and at some institutions right now, it's really difficult to actually gather official uh, documents from your previous school. On our website, there is a place where you can actually download an Excel file that is a template of a copy of your transcript where you can add your own uh, grades and which we would later check to make sure are uh, similar to that of your official transcript. Or you can copy and paste into one file several different uh, unofficial transcripts to ultimately share with us your full uh, collegiate academic history. We also, again, as far as the recommend, recommenders, um, we place the responsibility on you as an individual to make sure that your recommenders are working through and submitting their recommendation form by the application deadline. You do have the ability to, and I encourage you to submit your application prior to the time your recommender submits their portion. So you don't need to wait for them to satisfy that part. You would actually, even after the time that you have submitted your application, be able to check on the progress of your recommenders. So even though that is one of the parts of the application, when you have finished all the components of your application, click submit before the deadline. And whenever your recommenders are done, they can submit that after the fact as well. Um, we do typically have a policy that we do not accept updates after your application is submitted. So I encourage you to look thoughtfully to read after you've inputted all the information to go back to the start of your application and read all the information and make sure every single question we've asked and every form that you've added is looks and appears and is uh, clear and grammatically correct across your entire application because we likely will not be able to uh, accept any other uh, updates. We certainly welcome you to be able to work with and talk to different friends, families, colleagues, individuals, mentors to help you but with this piece of, uh, with, the, with this application tip, I do wanna make sure that you know that sometimes you can have too many uh, chefs in the kitchen and we don't want you to necessarily have so many people that you're gonna get so many differing ideas. 
Lots of people are going to want to help you through this process. So in addition to those people who can look over a resume, can look over an essay, we want you to also have the confidence that you can refer back to this sort of presentation. You can reach out to an admissions committee. We are here to try to support you in this process. Mm -hmm. And while we won't look through parts of your application, we're happy to answer questions where you have confusion in the process. And know that we are that type of resource for you, but you should and can ask the people around you to be supports because they see a side of you that we don't, and they can help make sure that you're highlighting the strengths of your own candidacy. The last thing that I'm gonna touch on before I get to your questions is that as soon as you click submit, I want you to celebrate yourself and the accomplishments you've had. We know the amount of time and energy and thoughtfulness that goes into every single application. And it's why we spend that same sort of comp, uh, that same sort of time and energy and thoughtfulness in reviewing. But regardless of an admissions decision, we want you to celebrate yourself even before you've heard a decision. Some of you are going to get really, really good uh, decisions and we're really excited by it. And some of you might be disappointed at some point in the application process considering all the schools that you apply to. And while I hope all of you only have things to celebrate, I want you to celebrate the accomplishments you've had and have confidence in yourselves and what you will do in the future, regardless of what any admissions decision may say, because you deserve that and you've earned that. Uh, and we want you to know from our side that we have that confidence in you as well. With that said, I'm going to move to the Stay Connected page. Um, so you see this in the background, but I'm going to open up the questions that may have been asked throughout the session today, um, and I'll respond to these over the course of the next 15 minutes or so. So uh, the first question I see uh asks about the team-based discussion interview and it asks specifically if we're anticipating any changes to the format for round one uh so i appreciate this uh question ting and so our response and what is going to happen at least for round one this year during uh this period of time where travel around the world and travel from uh, for candidates anywhere and travel for our team and members of our community anywhere is still uh, uncertain because of COVID-19. So we will be conducting all of our round one interviews in a virtual standpoint this year. Uh, this is actually what we did for round two last year, for round three, for MOLIS, this entire calendar year. And we've actually found that we've learned the same sorts of information that students' experiences have been very similar in the team-based discussion and one-on-one, -on -one, even in a virtual setting. So we are planning to do all of these virtual. They will likely be held in Zoom, and our team has become much more fluent in that ability. And we've seen, again, the successes of uh, each candidate in the same ways we would have seen in, the, uh, in an in-person setting. I see another question that asks for about the integrated and dual degree programs. Uh, the question specifically asks, is it required to apply to these, pro to these other programs at the time of your warrant application, or do you need to apply to, for example, the, the Master's of Science in Education program before entering Wharton? This is, a, this is another great question. So some of the programs that we offer, you, de you do need to apply to at the time of application. So that would include the, um, the Lauder Institute you apply for at the same time, the healthcare management program you apply at the time of your application. Most carry JD MBA candidates will apply at, uh, for the dual degree at the time of the application, although there are some uh, uh, rare instances where somebody applies either in their first year or second year of law school or during their first year of the MBA, but the vast majority are applying at the same time for these integrated programs. For the other dual degrees, your applications are separate. And if you're planning to uh, complete these at the same time, we do encourage you to apply at similar timeframes, but 
we actually won't review your application to the other dual degree programs. Again, the instance that uh, is being asked about specifically is the Master's of Science in Education. You would apply to that specific program separate from your Wharton application. And then you work with our, uh, between the two offices to actually figure out the manifestation of that and how you progress through your time. Uh, so there's another question about uh, how can an applicant with less years of work experience than the average uh, address that in the application? Uh, so this is a really nice question, Brian, and I, I appreciate the thoughtfulness with it. Um, so we have a, a wide range of years of work experience that our applicants will have. And let's talk about for the regular application, not considering our deferred enrollment program in this response. Uh, if you only have a I'll say a couple years of work experience and you think that it's fewer years than you might otherwise have, but you're still applying at this time. Um, your ability in the first essay question to be able to share thoughtfully how you have, uh, what you envision for your MBA program, what sort of skills and knowledge you hope to gain and what goals you have in the future and connecting that to the program is the strongest place for you to be able to emphasize and make clear how you're able to achieve in our program. And that is first and foremost like the strength and where you can have that. Another way that you can just address, or even if you're not specifically addressing it, you can just emphasize the capacity and the, the promise you have for the program is by being intentional about the types of information, the types of skills and knowledge and growth opportunities you've had already in your resume. And being able to highlight those different items will provide confidence to us and why we can see your skills and experiences uh, helping the people around you and contributing into the Wharton community, into our classroom, and later in your career. So your question from Aisha, specifically about the extracurricular activities. Uh, she asks, if you enter extracurricular activities into the application form itself, should they be removed from your resume so they are not duplicative? So ultimately, this is up to you, Aisha, or anybody who's in this uh, sort of moment in their application. We're intentional. We actually created that extracurricular activity section in our application so that you did not need to put that space in your resume. So it's actually intended to be able to give you more space in your resume without necessarily having that information be repetitive. We read your entire application in one sitting. So if we see it, both in the extracurricular activity section and your resume, that's not a disadvantage. That's not a negative. You're not required to remove it from your resume if you place it in the extracurricular activity section, but you can take something out of your resume that might be taking up valuable real estate on that piece of paper because you've placed it elsewhere in your extracurricular activity section. And again, that was the intent of that, those types of questions in our application. It was giving more space to talk about the more informative and uh, lengthy professional experiences, skills, and responsibilities you've had. Um, so again, it's your call. There's not a right or wrong, but the intent was to give you more space in the resume section itself. Sharish uh, asked a question about the organization size uh, found in the extracurricular activity section and what um, what size or what population you should be specifically calling attention to. So you actually have uh, the opportunity to put in a couple numbers there. You can share both the chapter size of the organization or the full international organization. Let's say you're uh, a member of such an organization where there's a chapter size and a national or international group as well you could actually put both of those numbers in that organization size as well um, and provide some details to that if you wish. So those are text field entries, most of those questions in the extracurricular section. And uh, you're, you're able to share, again, a couple different pieces of information within the text limits of that space. I see another question that asks if we prefer that you put your GMAT score on your resume 
Uh, this is a great question, Dharmesh. Uh, you actually do not need to. And I th there, because we see that information, the GMAT or your GRE score elsewhere in the application, that's information that does not need to be on your resume because, again, that's going to take up a, at least a line of your application, oh, sorry, of your resume. So use that line for something else or to create more space for an, another responsibility because we are, are, are going to see your standardized test score elsewhere. I see another question uh, as it relates to the admittance rate uh, between round one and round two for different populations. Um, I appreciate your question, Stephen. So the, there is no difference between the populations that are really applying to or that we admit between round and round one and round two. Um, you know, in broad terms, we're basically admitting half of our class or trying to admit about half of our class in round one and about half of our class in round two. Um, it's never exactly those, you know, 50-50, but it's again approximate that we have similar numbers of applications in each round and again similar uh, chance of admission in each of those two rounds. I will say that round three is the round that can potentially be uh, impacted by the enrollment found in the first two rounds. So if you know you want to apply for uh, entry of fall 2021, so that would be either round one, round two, or round three of this current admission cycle, you should apply in round one or round two because those rounds are not impacted by, again, the enrollment of previous rounds. If round three is really designed to be able to capture anybody who might not have been planning to apply uh, for the upcoming year, but then you know, because of a change in personal or professional circumstance, then realize that they did need to apply at that time, or maybe somebody who was planning to apply in round one or round two, and then different professional or personal circumstances delayed their uh, ability to actually submit by those deadlines, round three could capture them as well. But again, round three is a much smaller group, and it can potentially be impacted by the involvement found in round one and round two. Uh, see a great question by Alicia. Uh, Alicia shares that uh, you know the workload has been particularly intense over the past few years. Um, I imagine for many of you for the past few months as well. Uh, would the optional essay be a place to explain why you haven't been involved in as many extracurricular activities in recent years? This is absolutely the space. This is a great question to ask, and that's exactly the intent of that optional essay space. Um, Again, if you've had anything that has maybe impact your ability to be involved in other areas, uh, that's a great time for us to be able to learn why that may be and you being able to articulate in your own words. Again, we will understand uh, certainly the past few months, but even the past few years, we know you've been working so hard. We know that there's so many different responsibilities and some of you are working 16, 18 hour uh, days at times and working far more than the 40 hours per week that uh, your initial contractor may have uh, indicated would be as such. So we are totally understanding and it is not a disadvantage. Being able to share the, the amount of work and uh, the intensity of that work can inform us of uh, that sort of information. Another thing that your optional essay can share, and this isn't your question, but since we're on the topic, um, let's say you are in a work environment where it is not, uh, you're not surrounded by a team or supervisors that are necessarily encouraging of your pursuit of the MBA at this time. So you may feel uncertain about asking them to be a letter of recommendation because that could potentially negatively impact your professional opportunities for that year, a potential bonus for that year. We do not want our application process to negatively impact your professional setting, your work environment, whether it's for a couple months or potentially for more than that. So if for some reason you select people other than supervisors or people who are you're directly working with, we still want you to ask somebody who knows you, has had uh, opportunity to either get to know the work and your quality of work, or is maybe tangentially related to that, maybe a mentor. Um, Anybody who can respond to those questions, uh, those recommendation questions thoughtfully without putting you in a precarious professional or personal situation, 
are the people you ask. And let's say you're not asking a supervisor for those reasons, the optional essay can also inform us of why you made that selection. Uh, I see a question that came from David. Uh, he asked, is applying in different rounds or by different deadlines create a better or worse opportunity for financial aid or scholarship or fellowship? Um, this is a great question and the, the, the response to this is no. You're, the time that you apply is not going to impact your candidacy for the different fellowships we have. Um, we do not limit the fellowships or advantage round one applicants for fellowships over round two uh, individuals um, or anything of that sort. So apply at the round for you. We consider every single applicant for each of the merit-based fellowships that we offer and any of our students can uh, receive different financial aid opportunities um, no matter when they apply to the program. Um, I appreciate all the questions and I know I can't get to all of them today. I'm looking for one final uh, question uh, and then any other questions you may have, you can always reach out to our office and we will obviously be able to share different insights and we want to be a support. Um, the, the last question I'll respond to today was a recent one from Joseph. Um, he asked for individuals who are impacted by COVID-19 as far as uh, as far as it relates to potential layoffs or changes of work obligations or responsibilities because of changing professional environments, do you recommend calling that out in your resume within the optional essay or both? Um, this is a great question, Joseph. So uh, if any of you have been uh, impacted in some way professionally uh, due to COVID in terms of uh, the degree of your work or even, be, even maybe continue to be employed if you were furloughed or laid off uh, in your job, you can, I would encourage you not to necessarily uh, describe the circumstances in your resume. I think any description or think about anytime you're trying to describe circumstances, you should share that in that optional essay section. If you're trying to share timeline of work or responsibilities um, or maybe a cutoff in work responsibilities uh, in a bullet point, that's where the resume could be a, a great place. You're more than welcome to have elements of both of those items found in both of those uh, parts of your application. Again, it's gonna be corroborating information. It's gonna help inform, of, inform us of the larger picture. But if you're gonna be taking time to describe any sort of circumstance or situation um, or how a company had to lay off or maybe a client uh, had to retract from a, an agreement that was there with all of you, um, that would be space where the optional essay could be informative. Again, it's that catch-all for additional context and information. Um, again, I appreciate all of your time today for the questions that we didn't respond. Please feel free to reach out to our uh, to our team. We're going to host a variety of these uh, application tips webinars over the course of the coming weeks. So we hope you remain connected to us. Thank you again for your time. Please stay healthy and safe and well, and we'll talk to you again soon.